first of all, thank you everybody for, for attending this session. Uh, during the session, we'll mainly discuss about uh, Java performance techniques and their costs during the runtime. And we'll see a lot of optimizations that might happen inside the hotspot uh, and OpenJDK. A few words about myself. I'm a software architect, uh, overall uh, 10 plus years of uh, experience. Apart the software architect role, I also have um, from time to time, I'm a technical trainer inside the Luxor department, and here are a bunch of courses I conduct, so mainly on the performance and tuning and software architecture topics, the topics that I'm keen on. As well, I'm, I'm speaker and blogger, speaker to external and internal Luxor conferences. What we are going to discuss uh, uh, this evening, uh, what's the agenda, we will briefly start with a few um, things about just-in-time compiler. It's mainly an introduction, a uh, short, uh, let's say, briefing, because uh, right after that we will, go on, we will go on to focus about a lot of optimizations, and here uh, you have a list of them. For example, uncommon traps, null sanity checks, the virtualization, loop and rolling, bias locking, inlining, and we will um, conclude with some cases which prevents the just-in-time compiler to, to optimize the code. What is for you to take away out of this session? Uh, it's a better understanding about what happens under the hood inside the JVM from the just-in-time compiler perspective. The second point is uh, about understanding in a better way about all the optimizations, all the optimizations shared in the previous slide, uh, and how they are uh, tackled by the just-in-time compiler, and few cases uh, where these optimizations are prevented, um, plus how we can tackle such situations in case um, the just-in-time compiler is not able to compile the code, what would be the worker workarounds in such situations? In a nutshell, uh, the overall presentation, it might help you to better tune your application for the performance standpoint if you are to squeeze the ultimate performance out of your uh, application. Just before to start, a few things about my hardware configuration because it's important, mainly the CPU. Uh, I was using an i7 Skylake CPU with 16 gig of RAM, and from the software uh, perspective, uh, the majority of the tests were triggered uh, under Linux uh, Ubuntu distribution using uh, JDK uh, quite recently, it's one-to-one -one version, and few other tools that uh, I was using, uh, first it's JitWatch, a tool which help you to, for example, see the byte code and see the assembly code produced during the runtime. Java Micro Benchmark Harness, it's a macro benchmarking tool in order to, to test the performance. Um, inside the Java code, and HPJ meter. Uh, I used an HPJ meter just in one isolated case for the string that duplication test. Now let's start with the just-in-time compiler, and um, as I was mentioning in the introduction, it will be just a few things about it, just to, to put the context before we'll continue and dig in uh, in the optimizations. Here is the picture, um, the, the overall picture containing the, the main boxes, the main pieces uh, that, uh, that are related to the JVM. For example, we have the class loader, we have um, the bytecode interpreter, we have the just-in-time compiler, which are mainly related to the execution engine. And uh, during the runtime, um, the interpreter switches to the, the uh, to the compilation, and all the compiled code it's put it's it's mainly uh, stored into the code cache. Code cache is a dedicated heap area memory which uh, stores the 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 end methods, uh, the methods uh, in regards with the assembly or the native code. Today our focus is uh, on the just-in-time compiler, and if we have to, to zoom it a bit inside the just-in-time compiler, it comes in, in several shapes. The first one is it's called client, or C1. 
Uh, the client or C1 does uh, a lot of rock solid optimizations. Um, C1 do not make any assumption, uh, neither it uses any profiler. And uh, when it reaches the C1, the, uh, the client server, it's mainly uh, based on a method invocation counter, uh, which is around 1.4k invocations. The second, um, the second shape of the just-in-time compiler is called the server or the C2, and um, this uh, requires a lot of a lot of um, invocations because in this case it might uh, need a longer time to to optimize the code. Um, the number of invocations uh, for the invocation counter for the method invocation counter it's around 10k invocations. Um, plus it does a lot of speculative optimizations. For example, uh, it optimizes something based on the context it uh, it knows at that moment in time. It puts some some checks around that condition, and if the condition is later or deoptimized, it throws away the comp the code compile and uh, finds another implementation. In most of the cases, which it, it switches back to the interpreter. Um, the thing is that in C1. Um, we benefit quicker of the, the native code, but the, the optimizations are not in the best shape. Only C2, the server uh, shape of the compiler, it's able to produce those optimizations in a better shape. And uh, But the, the, the drawback of it is that it needs a longer time. It needs a longer profiling over the code to reach this, um, this steady state of the native code. Code. And in order to minimize this gap, they added um, inside the, the um, JVM, it's also a tier mode, which starts in C1, reaches quickly the C1, so we benefit the performance quite soon. But it continues towards C2 because we want the best optimizations during the runtime. If we have, for example, to take a look from the performance perspective uh, in regards with the time, uh, how, how it's going, the first level is the interpreter. Uh, since the JVM starting, it starts inside the interpreter mode, the bytecode is interpreted. Once it reaches uh, the method invocation counter 1.5k invocations, it triggers the C1. There is also another case to reach the C1, which is called on stack replacement. It's based mainly on, on the loopback edges. For example, in case we have a long running loop inside the method, uh, that context as well could trigger the C1. And um, uh, on top we have the C2, which, as I was describing, it's it's much performant. It, pro it produces the code in a better shape, but the, the let's say um, the inconvenient is that we need a longer profiling and a, a bigger number of invocations for the method. Um, making a comparison in between the interpreter and the C1, uh, in some cases uh, the C1 it's around uh, five times uh, quicker than the interpreter. And C C2, uh, in some cases, could also reach like a hundred of times quicker than the interpreter. So it, it varies a lot during the runtime in regards to the optimizations done. All of this being said, um, our rational for this session, um, it's based uh, on this. Uh, we have the three stages of, of the code written. The first one, it's, called, it's uh, the, the state of the Java code, the human, high, high human representation of our classes object. Uh, the intermediate level, it's the bytecode. And the last one, it's the native code, which is um, triggered mainly by the C2, C1 and C2. And during this talk, we will, we will focus on the source code. We will um, skip the byte code, the, the intermediate representation, uh, the intermediate state, and we will zoom inside the native code just to be able to prove all of these optimizations and to reach some conclusions. Why it's important to focus on the native code, um, to my perspective, um, because only in this case we will understand a lot of things that 
happens under the hood inside the, the JVM itself. Bytecode is also interesting, but in the bytecode we don't reach the ultimate performance. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we will study the native code uh, produced by the C2 compiler, not the C1. C1 has as well some interesting things, but during this talk we will be mainly based on the C2, so the highest level of performance. The first, uh, the first part uh, to we are going to to dig in and start with is the, the so-called uncommon traps. What is the, what is an uncommon trap? It's mainly a condition which is unlikely to happen, uh, but it might happen. Uh, at the moment in time, uh, when and when it happens, um, the compiler switches back in almost all the cases to the interpreter. Uh, I would say an uncommon trap. It's nothing else than a trampoline back to the interpreter. And because we switch, we bail back inside to the interpreter, we lose a lot of performance during the runtime. To understand better how an uncommon trap works and uh, how how it looks like, uh, let's let's take some trivial example. What we have in here, we have mainly a loop iteration from zero to 20k iterations, and inside this loop, we just call a hot method. The hot method, uh, when it is called, the, the argument for it is true, but the signature uh, of it is like this one, and the definition, the declaration of the, the method, it's, uh, it checks, for example, if the condition is true. If it is true, it returns one, otherwise returns two. Very trivial implementation. And now let's see what's happening during the runtime. To be able to, to profile the JVM and to be able to, to check the the assembly code, I have uh, ran uh, the, uh, the JVM with these arguments. Print assembly, it's mainly an indicator for the JVM to, to print the assembly for me. And um, I want the assembly to be in the Intel shape. There are two uh, there are two shapes mainly. Uh, it's AT&T syntax and Intel syntax, and particularly for this presentation, I chose the, the Intel syntax. And also, I disabled the tier compilation, uh, which means in in my case, I want to to use only the C2. I'm not interested in in the tier. Uh, for example, I'm not interested in the optimizations produced by by the C1. I want to go directly into the the C2. Um, and the, the, the last one, it's our, our main class. If we have to zoom it uh, inside the native code produce, uh, of course, I, I, I clean it a bit. Uh, what we have here, um, the RDX, it's mainly our parameter, uh, which is the Boolean. And there is a comparison between uh, this Boolean and uh, one. So mainly, there is a comparison between uh, the condition, if it is equal to true. If it is not equal, there is a jump to this label F000. And uh, if it is uh, equal, for example, if the condition is true, it returns one. But what is this jump? There is the question. This jump is mainly a jump to another part uh, which causes an uncommon trap. Uh, based on these uh, things that we saw at the moment, what, what's the idea with, uh, with this assembly code? Because uh, we called uh, in, in that loop from 0 to 20k invocations, we called the hot method only uh, using the true as argument. The just-in-time compiler was able to optimize the hot method for, uh, only for the, the, the true branch. But for the false branch, it added this uncommon trap, which means if I have to call the hot method with false, uh, this call and the uncommon trap, it's, it's hit. Um, and at the moment, what we have, uh, we, we have our method, which is optimized and compiled. Um, and the question is how much time it takes one, one call 
to the hot method after it was uh, optimized. Um, and for this, I use Java Micro Benchmark Harness and a one, one iteration uh, for this one method invocation mainly took around 144 plus minus 33 nanoseconds. And uh, what I did afterwards, I was curious if I have to call the hot method with false. What happens immediately? What's the time elapsed? And I've got a much bigger time elapsed. Uh, it's mainly a hundred of times uh, bigger uh, than the previous, than uh, the, the case when I call the hot method with true. And the question is why? Why we have so big difference between these two calls, uh, like a uh, hundred of times bigger. And to understand it, um, let's run again, uh, let's start the JVM again, but this time with print compilation, because I want to, to see under the hood what happens when, uh, what happens from the just-in-time compiler perspective. And um, what we have here, uh, it's a bit verbose and requires a bit of um, a bit of explanation. For example, the, the left column, it's mainly the timestamp, the number of milliseconds since the JVM has started. The second one, uh, it's, it's a compilation ID used by the, the compiler threads during the runtime. This percentage is uh, refers to the on-stack replacement. Um, what is an on-stack replacement, uh, it is mainly uh, triggered by the loopback ages when they reach a certain threshold. What it means, for example, I call my method and inside my method I have a long running loop. This long running loop ca can make the, the method hot as well. And the rational, uh, the just-in-time compiler, it's based, it doesn't make sense to wait for the next method invocation. Uh, let's, let's replace um, at that moment the interpreted frame with a compiled frame. So this is the on-stack replacement. When we have a long-running loop and the interpreted frame, it's replaced by a compiled frame. And because we had the on-stack replacement, we have a byte called Windex index which triggered the on-stack replacement. The, the number of bytes in here refers to the number of, of compiled bytecode size. The last uh, one, uh, explicit here, it's made not entrant. What, what, what it stands for? Um, for example, it happens in case of uh, either optimizations or deoptimizations, uh, and it mainly says um, if there uh, is a deoptimization, put aside this shape of, of the native code produced by the, by the uh, just-in-time compiler and switch it back to the interpreter. So basically, that version of the native call, it's locked. It might happen as well in case of, uh, for example, optimizations from C1 to C2, uh, when, for example, uh, the compiler is able, based on the profiling, to produce a better shape of, of the native code, and uh, as well, the previous shape of the native code, it's made not entrant. But in our case, it, it's, it's not not this context, in our case, uh, after I called hot method with false just one time, uh, it hit mainly the uncommon trap and put this, uh, the, the hot method which was produced by the just-in-time compiler, put it aside and it bailed back into the, into the interpreter. If we have to, to zoom it, um, zoom it uh, out a bit and if we have to make it a bit more generic, what happens, for example? Uh, every time we start the JVM, it starts in the interpreter. Uh, after a while, based on some, some criteria, it's either method invocation counter, either uh, this on stack replacement, which is triggered by the loopback age counter, um, it reaches the C2. And inside the C2, um, because we have the uncommon trap, when it hits the, the current thread, it hits the uncommon trap, it bails back inside the interpreter. But the question is, what happens with another thread with, uh, which runs, for example, the same version of the C2 produced? 
uh, code, but um, that thread doesn't hit the uncommon thread. Uh, in this case, the, the thread, which is the, the green thread, can run the method uh, as long as it doesn't reach the uncommon trap. All the other threads that might call the method after just one thread, at least one thread, hit the uncommon trap, they, they continue uh, with uh, the interpreter. So they, they switch and they uh, use the interpreter, the bytecode uh, itself. Um, so in this case, uh, the penalty, the, the performance penalty is drastically reduced during the runtime. All of this being said, so this is uh, a generic explanation. Uh, let's get back to our hot method context, and now let's try to optimize it again for the false. Uh, same, I have a long running loop. I call inside this long running loop the hot method, and I'm curious um, about what happens uh, from the uh, compiler perspective. Um, as we can see here, the first loop produced these two uh, print compilation um, statements, uh, which means, for example, the hot method was compiled um, and it was inlined as well. And because inside the main uh, we had this long running loop, the long running loop produced the on stack replacement for the main, and the main got compiled as well, even if the main was triggered just once for it, because the method invocation counter for the main method it's one in our context. But even in this case, because of, of the long running loop in here, it got compiled. After we called, uh, after we we hit the second loop. And and we call the method with false as the argument. It uh, the the it became made not entrant, which means uh, the. Uh, the native uh, was uh, locked, the native uh, produced by the just-in-time compiler was locked, and uh, because uh, we have as well a long running loop, it was optimized again, the hot method was optimized again, and the made method became uh, as well compiled due to the on-stack replacement. As you can see here, it's a, local, uh, it's a lot of back and forth, a lot of optimization, de-optimization uh, during the runtime. Uh, if we have to, to zoom it um, now uh, on the assembly code, on the native code produce, uh, what we saw here, there is no any uncommon trap. So we don't have any uncommon trap, and the just-in-time compiler falls back to the classic way of handling branches. One more uh, very interesting um, remark is that if I have to measure at the moment uh, how much time it take one hot method iteration, it's about 170 plus minus 47 nanoseconds. If you recall, uh, when I called the hot method uh, with true, it was around 144. But now, uh, having, uh, having it de-optimized and re-optimized it again, I've got a slightly uh, bigger uh, response time. And this is the idea. Um, when you first reach, uh, reach the, the C2 uh, with the uncommon trap, the performance was slightly better. After uh, the uncommon trap was, was hit and the code was de-optimized, and re-optimized again later on, um, the performance is slightly slower. Why? Because mainly we have in the assembly code produced a lot of jump instructions, uh, not jump instructions, we have a conditional checks. So, so these conditional checks are costly during the runtime. That's why we, we've got here a slightly slower uh, performance. Just to sum up, uh, based on the uncommon traps, if a conditional statement is following only a single branch, uh, as we had in our case, the uncommon trap, it's a good idea to optimize it. But um, when the uncommon trap is hit, the just-in-time compiler, when it re-optimizes back the code, it falls back to the classic way of handling the conditional statements, as we had in the previous slide, using, for example, part the C conditional uh, move not equal. Um, and 
Mm, just, uh, just to remind the uncommon trap, it's costly. Even if they might help in in certain situations, they are costly when they are hit. Uh, first, because we need to bail back into the interpreter, and afterwards it takes some time uh, until the method is re-optimized again. Inside the, the JVM during the runtime, there are a lot of un uncommon trap situations. Uh, for example, uh, for the, the unloaded classes, for the bimorphic calls, we are going to discuss this case uh, later on, and for the null checks uh, as well, range checks, everything it's, it's mainly in here. Uh, I would uh, try to, to share with you the null sanity checks uh, because this one is quite interesting. And to understand it, um, I created another very trivial example. I have uh, inside this loop, run running loop from 0 to 20k uh, loop iterations, a hot method. And all the times I called the hot method with a value which is not null. And in this case, um, the return, the hot method returns the value received as an argument um, multiplied by two. Otherwise, it just returns zero. If, if I call the hot method it now, it returns zero. Let's see how, how, how it is optimized during the runtime. Um, the same story, I ran the, the JVM with print assembly, print assembly option simple, and I disabled uh, the tier compilation, which means I'm interested in the C2, the, the first level. And as you can see here inside the assembly produced, uh, the RDX is the, the parameter for the hot method. And there is no test. Remember, uh, on the previous slide in here, we had this null check. But inside the assembly, we don't have any null test. And the question is why? Why we don't have such null test? And the explanation comes right immediately if we have to uh, read the, the explanation. It says there is an implicit exception which dispatches to a Another, um, another call to another method, which is mainly a, a null handler. What it happens? It's like in, in C or C++. What happens when we call uh, something which is null, we got the segmentation fault. The segmentation fault is raised by the memory subsystem. It is, it is, propagated, um, uh, it is propagated inside the operating system, and it is caught by the JVM. Of course, it's, it's very uh, performance uh, penalty uh, just because uh, there, there are some signals propagated back inside the, the JVM. And when the JVM receives the segmentation, uh, it calls the handler. So this handler is called when uh, after the method was optimized into this, uh, this shape, and I have to call the hot method with null. So mainly it handles, uh, it implicitly handles uh, the null checks by relying on default OS signals. And this way uh, it's, it comes for free. It comes for free and it is natively handled by the hardware. Um, what, uh, what I did further, um, I wanted as well to, to, to call the method with, with null, and I wanted uh, to re-optimize it back, uh, and I call it in the row uh, with a value not null. And in this case, uh, if we zoom it inside the, the native code produce, uh, we can see there is an explicit null check. Explicit null check, which we didn't have it in the previous uh, previous uh, version. Why is this added? Because the just-in-time compiler has now more context. Uh, has now more context because the hot method was called with null and 
since we call the hot method with now, uh, he thinks there might be another cases to call the hot method with nulls, uh, which means mainly to, to add an explicit test. And this test says that if the if the this integer is null, there is a jump to L001. L001 says I just want to return zero, so it mainly re, uh, um, uh, does a sort between EAX and EAX, which is an optimal way of returning zero, and does another jump on uh, to this label, which is mainly the the exit routine from that method, but. In, in in the other cases where uh, the the argument is not now it what it does it mainly moves the integer into the ax and there is a multiplication uh, uh, by 2 and um, the ax as it's implicitly returned and in this case, uh, we didn't have any uncommon trap, and again, since the, the just-in-time compiler hit it, uh, it switched back to the classic way of handling nulls. What would be the conclusion based on this um, based on this test? Null checks relying on signals um, are natively uh, handled. Uh, or raised by the hardware, and uh, they come from free, and they are natively uh, propagated by the operating system. Um, nevertheless, uh, when uh, when a null branch it's it's followed, the just-in-time compiler switches back to to the classic way of handling and uh, managing, producing the code. Um, as well, don't forget that when null happens, uh, null happens uh, during the runtime, it's very costly. It's very costly because the, the signals uh, produced and sent and caught by the JVM, there is a time we need to pay for them. Uh, the idea with this, uh, to, to eliminate these null sanity checks, it's mainly relying uh, on the fact that during the runtime, there are less nulls uh, that might happen in our application. But uh, of course, if there are a lot of nulls, uh, this context might slow down a lot uh, our application and impacts performance during the runtime. The next um, interesting optimization is called the virtualization. Uh, what's a virtual call, for example? Uh, it's a call to a method which might be overridden. Uh, it's a concept um, very uh, similar to C++. Um, in C++, we have uh, explicit virtual keywords. Uh, in Java, we don't have it. But implicitly, all the polymorphic calls are virtual calls. Um, and um, it's very interesting to, to understand what happened under the hood in case of, um, of these polymorphic calls um, by, by um, taking a look over this example. Let's suppose we have a base class which has a compute. Um, <laughs> Mainly, it's an abstract class which has a compute method, uh, and uh, the parameter is just an int, and it is extended by just one implementation. The implementation is ELG1. Uh, it extends uh, the CMAT, the base class, and uh, it defines the, the compute, the, the compute um, code for it. For us to test what happens and understand the optimizations, uh, what, uh, what I did in here is uh, I iterated uh, from 0 to 20k iterations, and I called inside the sloop uh, the hot method. What does the hot method? It calls explicitly the compute, which compute itself uh, multiplies the, the parameter, multiplies the, the E uh, by a constant. Uh, the constant uh, it's uh, in this case uh, 17. 
What we have during the runtime, if we have to to start the JVM with print assembly, Intel and uh, um, Intel syntax, and disabling the tier compilation, what we have in this case, as we can see, the uh, the native code produced it's quite simple. It's quite simple in the the sense that uh, the first uh, uh, instruction it's mainly a conversion between an int because we receive the int and we have to uh, to return a double. So there is a conversion between the int and double precision. And the second one it's mainly a multiplication uh, of the um, of the argument uh, by that constant that I was talking about. What's curious about this case is we don't have any tests. We don't test uh, if the instances of type ELG1 because uh, the, uh, during the runtime we have a polymorphic call, which is mainly a virtual call to the compute method, but uh, the native code we don't have any tests. We can conclude in this case that the, uh, the monomorphic calls, the monomorphic calls um, are mainly the calls having a single target invocation. In this case, um, what the, um, the just-in-time compiler does, it just inlines uh, uh, in lines uh, the body of the compute method. There is no any uncommon trap added, uh, uncommon trap for for testing if the um, the instance is of another type, probably for L2 or L3 and other possible implementations. Um, now, uh, because I was referring to the other implementation, other possible implementations, um, what if I, for example, create uh, this second implementation, which is called ELK2, and I test it uh, in the same way? For example, I have a long running loop, and I, I test it inside this long running loop. What would be my code produced during the runtime? And this time, it's a bit more verbose, but uh, in essence, it's quite easier. Um, what it does, um, the first, um, the first um, assembly uh, produce uh, the first native code instructions. It's like we had uh, in the previous case for the monomorphic calls. It's a conversion between int and a double precision. What happens uh, immediately after is an explicit check. Uh, in this case, the just-in-time compiler added an explicit check, as we can see here. It mainly compares uh, if the instance is of type L1. If it is instance of L, uh, L1, it jumps to this. It jumps to L000 and does the multiplication. Remember the multiplication between the int and a constant. Uh, if it is an instance of L2, it does the, the multiplication by another constant. In this case, it's 19. I, I chose another constant. But the question is, why, uh, what happens if I call with uh, another possible implementation, for example, L3? And, for, and to, to handle this possible the third implementation, there is a jump non t call to this L002, which is mainly uh, a call to an uncommon trap. So just to, to conclude our example, uh, the just-in-time compiler at explicit checks for these both implement, uh, implementations for L1 and L2 and put the uncommon trap, which is this call, for another third and fourth possible implementation, which leads to the conclusion that um, uh, the virtualization in case of bimorphic calls, bimorphic calls are the calls with two possible target invocations, um, they both are in line and uh, as well there is an uncommon trap added in, in, the, uh, in the code produced. What would be even more interesting is uh, if we add the third implementation, for example, the L3 implementation, and we have to test it in this way. For example, we keep the, the previous uh, test 
plus we had the uh, this loop for the third implementation and uh, in this case it might be a bit of surprise the the, the code produced the native code produced it's very simple what it does it's just an invoke uh, invocation to the to the runtime target invocation. In this case, in this case of this megamorphic call, a uh, megamorphic call uh, in our context is the call with three possible implementation for the virtual call. The just-in-time compiler uh, doesn't do any more inlining, neither any uncommon trap is added. If we have to summarize all the things that we proved and in discuss up to now from low to high, from the invocation cost perspective, what we have. The monomorphic calls um, uh, are, are the fastest ones. Uh, why? Because in the, uh, the case of monomorphic calls, um, the target invocation, it's uh, it's it's in line. The body of, of the call is in line, and there is no uncommon trap. For the second case, uh, where we had the bimorphic calls, uh, the bimorphic calls, both of them were in line, but in this case, we have to pay the cost of the uncommon trap plus the cost of the, um, uh, the, the jump instructions. And the second case, which, is, um, which has a slightly lower performance, is a case with megamorphic calls, uh, which are handled mainly as virtual calls. Uh, in practice, uh, the cost from a monomorphic call to a megamorphic call, it's around, uh, it's mainly less than 10 seconds. During my test, I encountered a penalty switching from the monomorphic to megamorphic calls uh, around 5 or 4 nanoseconds. I would say uh, on average is 3 uh, until 7, probably less than 10 nanoseconds, depending on the, the platform and the CPU. The next um, optimization technique, um, it's called loop unrolling. What it does, uh, the loop unrolling, um, the, the just-in-time compiler, uh, imagine we have a long-running loop, and uh, just to, to minimize the number of iterations, um, in a sense to minimize the number of um, jumps, uh, it does this loop unrolling by, for example, uh, adding, uh, like we have in here, we have this long running loop, by, for example, uh, calling uh, inside uh, the same loop iteration uh, multiple instructions. And uh, in this case, the, the number of uh, loop iterations is reduced. Our, our example in this context is I want to just create the sum uh, of, of an integers, integers represented by this array. And if I uh, want to, to optimize and uh, zoom in inside the native code produce, we can see here there are a lot of instructions. What what means all of these instructions, plus a few others that I removed because they are not so important for, for our proof, for our evidence. Um, let's first uh, try to, to dig in inside this, um, this um, uh, L00 label. What we have in here, uh, as we can easily spot, there are a number of eight additions uh, into the EX register, and at the end there is an increment by add, 8, which leads me to the conclusion that in this case, uh, the just-in-time compiler, what it did, it unrolled the loop by adding two eight uh, additions inside uh, the same iteration. Uh, at the bottom we have uh, a handling for the remaining, for example, if the array, the length of the array is not um, uh, multiple by eight, the remaining is it's handled here. And uh, another interesting uh, thing is that just before going into this loop, and um, doing all the, the sums, um, the just-in-time compiler 
peeled the first loop iteration. The loop pe uh, peeling is also a powerful technique and might enforce, for example, particular memory align alignment. Uh, as well, in some cases, uh, if there are some uh, explicit uh, null checks, uh, it might uh, put them outside of the loop. Uh, if we have to rewrite this uh, assembly, because uh, I might agree, it's it's a bit, um, uh, it's not so quite um, so quite straightforward. If we have to write it into the pseudo code, what we have, this is the representation. So this is the the peeling for the first iteration, and here inside this uh, loop, we have to compute the the sum. Uh, within uh, eight statements and at the end uh, it's a comparison if the index is mainly less than the array length, uh, if it uh, is it uh, moves outside and handles the remaining. Um, so that's that's a powerful technique uh, in for the, the just-in-time compiler to reduce the number of, of uh, jumps. Plus, it, it might enable as well the, the parallelism uh, uh, on the, the instructions. It might open the door to a parallelism uh, on the instructions. Uh, and here I have a question for you. I would kindly ask my colleague uh, if it is possible just for several seconds to enable the chat. Um, so think to this and just quickly answer inside the chat. Uh, let's suppose now we have in mind the context of loop unrolling and uh, when we, for example, do some code reviews and, or, for example, we write some piece of the code and uh, we rely on these uh, loops, uh, we want to be a bit, let's say, smarter in advance. By smarter in advance, I mean we want to, to unroll the loop in advance by us, by programmers. And the question... Um, the question is, what do you think about this approach? Would it be a good approach or not? Just take several seconds and uh, uh, if you can post the, the answers into the chat. Okay, I don't see, okay, any guess? Okay, so our time said no, uh, I suppose yes, it's not a good idea, thank you. Any other guesses? Yeah, maybe it's it's good to send to all the participants. Okay, good. I expect to get the same performance from the compile loop. Okay, good guess. It will work dramatically faster. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, we'll see if it works dramatically faster. No, not good because makes readability bad. No, I don't know. Yeah. Very, very good, uh, very good uh, answers. Thank you very much uh, for for your uh, for your um, answers. Um, okay, so uh, we can continue uh, um, with uh, the explanation. Uh, the last one is: it's bad for the CPU that doesn't support, vec uh, I suppose, vectors. Um, okay, okay, um, okay. So. If you want to post another thing, yeah, yeah, vector instruction, yeah, I got it. Vectorized optimizations. I think it's not a good variant. Guess it's hard to optimize for compiler. Yes, yes. You you had a very very good clues. 
Okay, I uh, I think that's uh, that's all about it. Let's let's see what happens. Uh, so um, I think the last one was a bit uh, closer to, to to the real answer. It might be even harder for the just-in-time compiler to to optimize having a loop into this shape. Let's see what what happened. Uh, let's let's provide the evidence. Um, in this case, um, uh, having this code uh, and uh, based on the rational that uh, I wanted to be a bit smarter in advance uh, because I know the loop are rolling, how it works, uh, I wanted to be a bit smarter and I want to manually did the loop are rolling by myself uh, when I wrote the, the piece of the code. Um, what I did, I compiled the, the, this method uh, and I'm not going to show you the assembly code. It's, uh, it's a bit more difficult difficult to understand a lot of uh, a lot of native code instructions but what i did i just summarized the native code shape into this pseudo code because i think it's more uh, it's in a better shape to be understood uh, and as we can see the the loop peeling technique it's still here uh, the just in time compiler peeled the the first um, the first loop out of the loop uh, and what it did as we can see here uh, it optimized in a similar way it did uh, when we had the normal loop just one iteration uh, just one statement per loop and um, so if we take a look on on this loop it's it's closer to the to the previous one uh, what might differ is just the loop peeling but what what did the compiler in reality? Uh, the compiler put much effort in order to optimize this. Um, uh, more uh, more specific, the just-in-time compiler had to re-roll re the loop before to do this uh, rolling. What is re-rolling? So the compiler is based on the assumption that uh, this loop unrolling is wrong or it's not quite wrong. I would say it's not in a better shape. So based on this assumption, it put a bit of effort in re-rolling, I mean uh, switching it to the, to the version of having just one statement per iteration and after that state it tried to uh, roll it again that's why it, at the end we still have uh, eight iterations so as, as you uh, as you also uh, guessed uh, I wouldn't say it's a good way to do this in advance because the just-in-time compiler has to put more uh, more effort in re-optimizing it back to sum up what we have discussed, loop unrolling reduces the number of branches. Uh, um, that's why we have this uh, technique uh, during the runtime. Um, and as well as you guessed, one answer was uh, about this. Uh, it, it helps, uh, for example, the instruction level parallelism, and it might allow basic block level vectorization. So you, you had a very good clue, a very good intuition. Um, so in, in a nutshell, I don't encourage you to, this, to do this manual loop unrolling. Just uh, write the code in the more natural way and let the just-in-time compiler to be busy and to take care of these optimizations. The next one is called string deduplication. The next performance technique. What is string deduplication? Uh, it's there since um, uh, 1.8 update 20 and it's enabled by default, it, it's enabled uh, mainly uh, only with the uh, garbage first. Uh, on the on Java 1.8, the garbage first collector, it's not active. It will be defaulted since uh, 1.9. Uh, what it does, imagine we have a lot of strings, uh, in our case two strings, uh, having uh, each string having lots of value. So in our case, both strings are, are backed by similar char arrays. Similar, when I say similar, similar uh, based on the content. Uh, string duplication technique, what it does, 
Uh, during there is a specific phase uh, during the the G1 Gerbish first, um, and the Gerbish first uh, searches through the heap and uh, searches from strings that have the same hash code and might be backed by the same char array. In this way, the Gerbish first collector is able to remove the redundant char arrays. And um, in this case, uh, as a consequence, uh, it minimizes the, the heap uh, occupancy. So um, in uh, the, the, this technique, it's, it's mainly raised from the, the, the real uh, cases because uh, when you will profile the application, you will, hear, you will see in the histogram a lot of char arrays. So let's minimize this uh, char arrays by trying to, to link the strings uh, uh, to similar charities if it is possible. And uh, having this in mind, I wanted to test if string the duplication impacts performance. What I did in this case, I created, uh, I, I stress test the heap by creating a lot of strings, and I started the program uh, with a bounded um, size of, um, of memory. In this case, it was one gig. Uh, and I did two tests one with spring, spring the duplication and another one without using string the duplication. So mainly the red one is for the uh, string the duplication and the blue one is without string the duplication. And what I was interested in it was mainly uh, in stop the word pauses. And this is the proof that the standard duplication impacts the performance during the runtime. Why? Because uh, the, the G1 thread has more work to do in order to, to mark the possible eligible strings uh, to be uh, backed by, uh, to, to be reduced and backed by the same char arrays. So this has, uh, this uh, brings more CPU cycles. That's why we encounter here more stop the war pauses. But nevertheless, it might be useful in, in, in cases exactly like this when we have a bounded um, amount of memory because string that duplication prevents out of memory in this case. Uh, I, um, I say that uh, this context was to, to create um, to create a lot of strings, and uh, the life cycle of my application was slightly uh, delayed um, because the, the, the technique, uh, string the duplication, cleaned uh, a lot of redundant char arrays. If we have to look uh, um, on it from the heap uses perspective, we might see that uh, in case of the blue ones, um, the heap, I mean, without using string the duplication, the heap usage was higher than in case of of using string the duplication, which leads us to conclude the following two things. String the duplication reduces the memory footprint, and it's a very powerful technique uh, when you have a bounded amount of heap memory, but uh, the string the duplication impacts performance. Impacts performance because, as we saw, the Gerbish collector, uh, the G1, um, spends more time in uh, reclaiming the, the heap by removing the, the char, the redundant char arrays. The next technique is called biased locking. That's that's quite um, a pretty old technique. Uh, why I was saying it's it's pretty old because it's it's defaulted inside the JVM since uh, 1.6. Uh, I don't remember anymore the update, but it's it's there since 1.6, and uh, it comes as well from the practice um, because a lot of uh, developers abused by the synchronized, uh, even if in reality there was just one thread that was calling that synchronized block. In this case, the bias locking scheme is a powerful mechanism. Why? Because uh, if, um, if it proves there is no contention, uh, we don't pay the cost of the, the real synchronization. And I wanted to test this by creating uh, this uh, uh, loop. Uh, inside this loop, I created 50 threads. And inside, the, inside the, each uh, thread, I was putting a synchronized on the shared instance. And each thread mainly uh, incremented the counter. And I started the thread, and I joined them. Uh, 
how I started the JVM, uh, I was using bias locking startup delay zero. Why? Because the bias locking scheme it's implicitly uh, started after the, the four seconds. Why is there? Because uh, based on the rational that in the beginning uh, there is a lot of uh, contention uh, and uh, it doesn't make sense to activate bias locking since the beginning. I also uh, I was also interested in uh, and the safe point statistics and unlock diagnostic VM option um, you can't use, for example, application stop time without uh, using the unlock di diagnostic VM options. And here is the output that I've got. As you see, it's very verbose, but uh, the things that I was interested in were, were mainly the stop the world pauses. And if we counter all the stop the world pauses, we uh, we sum up and we um, we get around two milliseconds um, to run our application. Just to compare with uh, with uh, another uh, mechanism, uh, with another version uh, where we don't have uh, bias locking scheme enabled. Uh, in this case, what I did, I just say explicitly to the JVM, please disable the bias locking. Uh, and in this case, uh, I was using the, the normal synchronization. And in this case. Um, we didn't have any stop the work pauses. So here, uh, the, the total time for which application threads were stopped was uh, uh, zero seconds, which uh, leads me to the second conclusion. Bias locking is a powerful technique. Um, and uh, it it saves the real con the, the real synchronization overhead in case there are no contented logs but if there are con there is a contention and especially uh, what we had in our case we had just one lock which was shared by a lot of threads the bias locking scheme it's not a good way because you have to pay the, the, the cost of the stop the world pauses. So um, just a recommendation for you, if you know in advance there is a lot of contention in your application, maybe it's not a good technique um, or maybe an advice to disable the bias locking since the beginning. The next one is called inlining and concurrency implication. Um, this is quite interesting because, for example, um, uh, the answer why inlining is useful, the first answer that my raise is because it saves the, the call uh, stack pops and pushes. But it's not like that. This is the the, I would say, the naive explanation. In reality, it allows the aligning, allows a lot of powerful optimizations. For example, if the method don't raise exception and the just-in-time compiler can prove that uh, based on the consistent control flow, uh, it, can, um, it can optimize it uh, in a better shape. Uh, the second is that if the just-in-time compiler uh, um, uh, inlines the coli inside the caller like a big unit, uh, it's better to optimize both of them like um, in isolation. Another explanation would be if the just-in-time compiler proof the memory is not changed in between the, the method calls, uh, this saves the number of memory loads. And uh, this is the, the last one that we are going to, to tackle it at the moment. Let's suppose we have this long-running loop, and inside the long-running loop, we have the we have an object and we want to get the height. Uh, it's mainly a property for that instance. Uh, and we want to get the height twice, plus we get the width uh, twice again. What is in difference, uh, what, what makes a difference is this counting line method in, in the middle. Why is the counting line method in the middle uh, and how it uh, looks like? Let's see uh, immediately. So uh, a counting line method, why I call it in this way, uh, it's basically in reality this method can't be in line. Why it can't be in line? Because as we can see here, there is a call 
to another method so the, the sequence called that it's more than nine in our case and it is not in line by default because inside the just the, the JVM there is a, a parameter which says um, the if if there is a max inline level greater than nine I can inline that method and because the method is not in line uh, it might have some performance implication to check these performance implications, let's see how our method looks like uh, the, from the native code perspective. Um, as we see here, there are two explicit calls to the high and two explicit calls to retrieve the width. And in the middle, it's our call to the method which couldn't be in line. Um, so what we have here, it's mainly if we have to summarize, uh, putting it more generic, if we have if we have to call a property on a method um, on an object, sorry, uh, and in the middle there is a method which can't be in line. The just-in-time compiler assumes the memory could be changed by other threads that might have a reference to the same uh, object, to the rectangle. And what it does, it is forced to reload the, the, the value from the memory. That's why we had uh, twice uh, call a uh, call to the to retrieve the height and twice a call to retrieve the width. To test uh, and to prove that uh, this uh, it doesn't happen anymore, if we uh, change the max in line level to ten. Um, we have to run it again, and this time, as we can see, there is just one call to, to get the height and just one call to get the width. Um, and this, these are uh, the, the additions uh, and the multiplications. So in this case, I would say that uh, since the just-in-time compiler inlined the method, uh, it, was, uh, it was able to prove there are no other thread that might change the memory and there is no sense to reload it again from the main memory. And here are some, some um, important or um, quite handy um, recommendation for you. For example, um, if you have methods like uh, greater than 35 bytes in your code and uh, that method is called uh, less than uh, two, two and fifty times, those methods are not in line. So uh, by default, uh, those methods should be less than 35 bytes uh, and to be called more than 250 times in order to be in line. Uh, actually, this max in line uh, size, it's a bit confusing. It's not quite the max in line size. The max in line size is this one, the frequent in line size, which says um, all the methods, uh, the hot methods, the frequent call methods are in line if they are less than 325 bytes. And the last one uh, in here is the maximum level, which is default to 9. For you, for example, to test uh, your the, the method size, there is a quite handy tool used, JARSCAN, uh, named uh, JARSCAN, which allows you to spot all the methods that are over that inline threshold and to refactor them in, in your application. And um, let's uh, let's conclude our talk with the method that do not JIT. We have as well some situations, of course, of course, corner cases. Uh, in our case, um, the first uh, one it's called um, the case of huge method. What is a huge method? It's uh, it's a method um, for that uh, the body is more than eight thousand bytes. I've created such method. Um, of course, it's a bit of exaggerated case, and I wanted to test if, if this method gets compiled or not. Um, and to prove it, um, I, uh, I ran the, the JVM with print, compil print compilation, and here I see I don't have any any hot method, uh, which leads me to the conclusion that uh, the hot method wasn't able to be uh, to be compiled. If I have to to see it explicitly inside the JIT watch, uh, the tool which shows us the assembly, 
uh, the bytecode and the source code, we see here there is no JIT it or no JIT compile code for this method. If we have to um, to search inside the, the JVM, there is a flag which says "Don't compile huge method," which is uh, which, is, which is set to true by default. Um, also. I search uh, on the web and I found this. Uh, this comes from from the JDK guy saying that saying like compilation of very large method by very large or huge methods uh, methods that are over 8,000 bytes. Uh, this is not tested well, so by default let's disable their compilation. But of course uh, you can you can enable it back. And after I did this, I I saw my method in here which got compiled. The second case is the case where we have uh, a method with a huge number of parameters. In my case, I put uh, 70 double parameters and inside the body I returned the sum of them. Um, what I had in this um, in this case, if I ran with print compilation, I saw these um, JIT warnings saying that are supporting incoming calling sequence, are supporting calling sequence. Again, there is an open uh, task on the JDK side. Probably it comes from the, from the sixth version. It was raised and target uh, sixth version, but it is postponed uh, until the 10th the, the version of the JDK. In closing, I would like to quote the Richard Feynman, a uh, wonderful mind, uh, which says, uh, or which said mainly that it doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are. Who makes the guess? or what is your name. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That's why during the entire talk, I wanted to prove the evidence for you during the runtime what happens, and I chose the C2 version because there is no other best way to prove the, the, the best optimization that might happen during the, the runtime. And also, I'd like to, to encourage you to keep always and ex uh, to keep always on experiencing new things because this is the way you understand them in a better way and also to profile when you have to profile something uh, you uh, also be curious to profile down to the hardware level. I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for your time spent this evening and I appreciate um, if you have questions. Thank you very much. If you have questions, you might post them in the Q&A panel. Yes, so uh, somebody is asking if the session will be shared. I think yes, it will. It, it was recorded and it will be um, posted on the Luxoft website. Okay, so here I have some questions. Let's iterate through them. Um, How about predicting if array length is uh, dividable by four in this case? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, so the, the compiler um, um, optimized the code uh, using eight iteration and it has a link to the hardware. Uh, 
that's why we have eight. If it is uh, dividable by four um, and there might be some remaining, it will still have the, the eight iteration, at least uh, on my hardware configuration, and it will handle the remaining of the three in the end um, after the loop, because the first one is the loop peeling. Could you recommend some literature or websites? Uh, oh, yes. Um, for example, uh, the best thing that I could recommend you, there is, um, uh, there is a Safari um, online se uh, session. It's called uh, Performance uh, or Java um, uh, Runtime Optimizations. Um, you, can, uh, you can search it on the Safari. Uh, I don't recall at the moment some literature, but for example, you can search the, the, the blog for the Nitsan, you can search for the blog for the uh, Alexei Shipilev, and as well I can back with you with some, some literatures on this topic, because at the moment I don't recall them anymore, and uh, there might be a lot, but I'll get back on this and I'll send them to you. Another, it's mainly an assumption, if I understood correctly, that if my code really uses locks, so it's really multi-threading, then I should switch bias locking. Um, bias locking is enabled by default. You don't have to switch it. Um, the bias locking, it's, it's enabled, and the just-in-time compiler um, switches in, in the bias locking or uh, starts with the bias locking uh, unless you explicitly disable it. You, you don't have to worry too much about that. So what is the best way to handle testing uh, 8K plus methods? Um, I would say uh, go back to the clean code principles. Uh, go back to the clean code principles and don't write so huge methods. Nevertheless, if you have them and if, for example, you inherit them from the third party APIs, uh, you don't have a choice to, to refactor them, uh, in this case, uh, probably it's 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 a choice to to disable uh, don't compile huge methods uh, on the JVM, but nevertheless the the recommendation from the JDK is to don't do that. So it's mainly you are all your own. Another uh, implication of enabling uh, the compilation for huge methods is in regards to the code cache. Code cache could be easily filled up, and uh, you will stress a lot the flushing. Uh, policies on the code cache. So I'd rather say first try to, to rewrite it. I got uh, really, really a lot of questions. Um, well, okay. Does it help to set inline level to 50 plus? How many functions can the compiler inline at once? Um, it, it will help. Um, it will help, but uh, be careful because also the inlining it's dangerous uh, when you get into the de optimization for example imagine you have a full method um, no let's call, let's say you have an a method which calls b c d e so all of this uh, calling sequence and suppose you had uh, 50 inline methods inside just one uh, the thing is that if you have some uh, if if the just in time compiler reaches um, a condition which uh, proves one optimization inside that huge inline method made out of, let's say in this case, 50, it's not 
um, it's not valid anymore. Uh, everything gets de-optimized back. And this de-optimization is costly because it's like the reverse of the on-stack replacement. So it, uh, it, it switches back um, and it continues uh, inside the interpreter. Uh, my advice for you is to don't set the inline level so deep because uh, it might help you, but in this case, uh, just to sum up, in case you face the de-optimization, it's, it's, it's very painful. Uh, have uh, Java streams loop are rolling? Um, I haven't tested Java streams um, and to check if there there is some loop rolling, um, I, I will test it on my side and I might get back to you. I, I suspect um, if if it relies um, on on the pure loops, yes, but uh, if it relies on sort of uh, map reduce, uh, I doubt. Are features uh, in Java like optional and streams killing JIT optimizations uh, to a lot of null checks? Um, this is um, an interesting question. I'd say not due to um, uh, null checks, but also the, the be, be careful how you use the streams because the streams are not quite handy in, in all the situations. Uh, for example, what I recommend for you is just to, to read the NQ model and how to use the streams because there in some conditions the streams might impact performance a lot if you don't use them uh, consciously. Um, so just a quick answer for that. Uh, it's, um, it's not quite the case. If you run the same code several times, it will uh, be optimized and it will work faster. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, initially starts in interpreter based on some uh, method evocation counter or loopback edge counter, it, it is compiled, it becomes hot, mainly this is why it is called the hotspot JVM, based on the hotspot, so the, the, the pieces of code that are intensively used, triggered, and uh, it, it is compiled. And of course, uh, based on the level of the, the compilation, if it is C1 without profiling, with basic profiling, with full profiling, there are some intermediate um, levels, it becomes more uh, efficient, more faster. Nevertheless, uh, the profiling on the method itself done by the C2 impacts as well uh, the performance. Of course, um, in, in a uh, lighter way, but also impacts performance. How do you know it's time to analyze assembly code? I would answer the second one. <laughs> uh, it's, based on, it's based on the compilation threshold. Uh, remember during my talk I was using the 20k iterations. Uh, the compilation threshold is even less. The compilation threshold is 10k iterations for the C2. So I would say I'm pretty sure that if I run uh, for the C2 at least uh, 10k iteration, the code is compiled. If I use the C1, I benefit of the assembly code after 1.5 iteration. So it's mainly based on the method uh, invocation counter or the compile threshold. Uh, nevertheless, also uh, the on-stack replacement, uh, let's say, um, metrics can trigger the compilation. And here I have, um, I might have an explicit slide to show it to you. For example, in this case of on-stack replacement, um, for the, f uh, so uh, we discussed about uh, just to answer your question how do I know it, uh, it is uh, the produce the assembly code based on the compilation threshold which is 1.5k for the client and 10k for the server but it is also triggered by this on-stage replacement which might have uh, different values for the client and the server as well so based on this rational, I, I know the code is compiled. Did you see an example where that runtime optimizations gave you bigger boost than other performance improvement techniques like multi-threading cachement? Um, uh, it depends what you understand through uh, bigger boost. Um, 
almost all the techniques presented during those presentations are for the ultimate performance to squeeze out of the performance. Uh, based on my experience, what I saw that dramatically impacts your performance are mainly the data structures um, chosen in a proper in an improper way. Uh, also, the memory access patterns impacts performance. Uh, also, the complexity of the algorithms impacts. Uh, impacts performance, also the psychomatic complexity impacts performance. Uh, so I would say these are in the category of uh, bigger impact on the performance. Um, and uh, the techniques that I presented here, it's more if you want to squeeze a bit more of the performance. And of course, caching. Caching, it's a, the, it's a very handy technique when you want to, to achieve. Depending on the caching strategies, it's a quite handy technique. So yes, I would say yes, caching, it's a good one. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I uh, apologize in advance if I missed some, some of the questions uh, because um, it was a bit of, um, of clutterness uh, between the questions and the answers. Uh, if, if it is the case, please, um, please send me a mail. Uh, my, um, one second. Um, my, um, on, on my uh, company address or on Twitter. Thank you very much.